Good morning. Good morning, system leaders. Good morning. I am really glad to be here and to be invited. Uh, thank you to all the organizers here. And I'm really glad to be at The Hague, where in Africa, if you talk about The Hague to a politician, they understand that that is the place where the International Criminal Court is located, <laughs> and they could easily be visitors of the law. But I feel that actually, now that I'm here, and thinking about all the issues we are talking about, because the International Criminal Court was created to support the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, I think there are not enough human rights abusers that end up at the ICC. Because I think the worst human rights abuse and the worst crime against humanity, it is actually absence of sanitation and clean water to children. <laughs> and that is what I want us to talk about today. So next time I come, I'll probably come along with a few more of them from the continent of Africa. Let's talk about the Great Convergence, because we're talking about systems here. The first thing I want to highlight is that human development, generally, the reason we are all here, the reason we are able to be here today, is because of a complexity of systems. It is actually a convergence of systems for us to be here. And if you look at this chart, which I borrowed from the Lancet Commission on Global Health 2035, it's a world converging within a generation. I want to highlight this because I'll make reference to it as we go along. And uh, I'm looking for a pointer. I don't think there's any, but you'll, you'll go along with me. At the end, we won't increase labor productivity, which is only a product of increase adolescent and child health and nutrition and increase adult health and nutrition. And therein lies the whole construct of human capital development and the human um, capital index of the World Bank to say when you add health and you add education, then you end up with people who are highly productive and who actually realize their potential. You can look up the human uh, capital index uh, of, the, of the World Bank. But for you to deliver that, then you need holistic services to all those services will include water and sanitation, food, health services, everything that a human being needs to actually live a productive and positive life. That is what we have captured in the concept of universal health coverage, which is holistic, and we'll talk a little more about that, and the relationship between that and water, sanitation, and hygiene. But you cannot have adult health and nutrition you cannot have increased adolescent and child and nutrition without holistic services that enable life in its fullness. But we also know that these two happen when there is also certain constructs like low fertility and low child mortality. And the two are related. And again, we'll mention that because we know that women in Africa and women across the world in the 17th, 18th century, got more and more children because the rate of survival was a lottery. You knew that because half your children could die, then you wanted to have as, twice as many as possible so that if some die, then you are left with some. So we know that fertility is related to child survival. Therefore, you need to increase child health for you to actually achieve a lower fertility per woman, which allows spacing and actually better health outcomes for the children. And if you don't have that, you would end up, like we have in many countries in Africa, Burkina Faso, uh, Chad, Mali, where because women have a high fertility rate, you have a very high dependency ratio, where only a small number of working population is actually supporting young children and supporting those who are jobless. In some countries, you have 110 people being supported 
by maybe 60, 70 working population, which means it's very difficult to create wealth because you're taking care of an entire population. Therefore, you can't create health. You can't create wealth. We know that development of Europe has been led by that demographic dividend. Demographic dividend is really this. It's when you have a higher working population than the dependent population. In Africa, we are facing a challenge where the young people, 50% of the population is under 18. And then you, even for those above 18, you have a very low employment rate, which means that the small working population is supporting a huge population under 18 who are not working age yet, and they're in school, hopefully. But then also a huge population who should be working, but they're not because there are no jobs. So for you to actually have proper human development, you need to increase the ratio of workers, dependents, and that's the demographic dividend. So demographic dividend is not having more young people. It's having more healthy, educated, working young people. And then you have all that coalescing into increased labor productivity. We can talk about all the other things. Maybe one of the things I need to pay attention to is the one here on my right, increased school attendance and cognitive capacity. Because you need, by the time, if you look at, uh, again, to refer to the uh, World Bank Human uh, Capital Index, it says that the collective experience and skills that an individual gains by the time they get to 18 years, which is made up of their health experiences, meaning how well were they? Were they breastfed? Were they well nourished? Did they actually end up with episodes of malaria? Did they end up with episodes of diarrhea as they grew? Did they end up with episodes of pneumonia and hospitalization? Did they actually end up with proper nutrition under 1,000 days? In which case then they developed their cognitive ability. And now once they have been nurtured that way, did they go to school for 14 years, which then utilizes their cognitive ability to go to school to get educated. So by the time they are 18, they have a collective skill and health set that sets them up for success in life. If you just look at that and you add up the indices, because it's a, it's a multiple index, you end up with a potential at 18, a child born in Singapore, at 18 years, they have 88% of their human potential to conquer the world, meaning they have lost probably only 12% of the human potential through a little disease, maybe a few days lost in school. But if you look at the continent of Africa, Uganda specifically, they'll have only maybe 38% of the human potential remaining. Because maybe the girl dropped out of school because there was no sanitary pads or there was no sanitation and water in school. And therefore, every time they were going through their periods, they dropped, they didn't go to school. Or they had multiple malaria episodes, or there was no adequate school anyway. And therefore, this eats away at their potential. And by the time they get to 18, they have only 38% of their life potential remaining on average. Whereas it's above 80 in Singapore. I'm sure here in the Netherlands, it's probably close to 80. Across Africa, the average is 45%, meaning that 55% of the potential of children is lost through before they get to 18 because of poor health, including water and sanitation, and school as well. And they are all related, so I wanted to pay attention to that a little. So let us just keep this in mind as we go to the next chart, which is this thing about life expectancy at birth. That everything you talked about, human development, is a continuum, it's a, an aggregate, it's a composite of all these issues working together, all these systems working together. Health, education, nutrition, water and sanitation, all of them working together. The thing I want to demonstrate to you in this chart is that public health has always been ahead of medical discovery when it comes to increasing life expectancy. Life expectancy is how many years you expect to live from the day you're born. Today, a child born today will have a different expected life if they were born in a low-income country than if they were born in a high-income country. But if you look at this, starting off from um, you know, the early centuries, you'll see that up to about the mid, you know, 1800s, the biggest killer was plague, famine, and war. It was those three things. Famine, again, related to the way people are living, uh, absence of water, there was no proper organized agriculture, 
Agriculture is a new discovery. It's actually, when you look at these years, it's just started somewhere in the middle, or maybe 17th or 16th century. And then there was war over resources, over water. The Roman Empire was probably the most organized of the governments. And what did the Roman Empire do? They organized themselves around agriculture and water. That's what the Roman Empire did. The first organized water system in Rome was 320 years before Christ, B.C., meaning it's about 2,300 years ago, first organized system of water. So this age of war, plague, and famine, and plague was related to water contamination. It is a black plague. It was death of masses of people. I don't know how many of you know the John, you know, the John Snow story and the water in London and the public health and water sanitation coming together around the early 1900s, and that leading to a huge improvement in life expectancy from somewhere in the mid-1800s, the first public health revolution. And that I call, and these are my own coinage, age of public health improvements. That was way before the age of medical discovery. So public health is always ahead of medical discovery when it comes to human survival. But I don't think we have learned enough messages on this to date. Of course, the age of medical discovery came to continue, but you can see there was a huge jump, and this was largely water, sanitation, nutrition. Clean water. Treated water. So let us now look at this, and this is what I called the worst crime against humanity today. If you look at that chart, when we talk about life expectancy at birth, we are basically talking about survival from birth to how many years. But the biggest reduction factor of life expectancy is actually death before five years. So if you could improve survival under five by reducing deaths around neonates, which is huge and catastrophic, almost 40% of children under 40 years die within their first month. And also survival of children from pneumonia, malaria, diarrhea. If you could just do that, you'd increase human survival and life expectancy exponentially. So look at this chart. And what does it tell you? It tells you that actually our biggest failure is under five years. That more than 5 million children die every year. That is about 14,000 children daily under five years. That is 45,000 children will be dead by the time we finish this conference. 45,000. About 56% of those, 58%, are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Another 26% are in, in, in Asia. So you can say about 84, 83% of all these children, 5 million of them are dying in, are dying in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So come along with me and ask ourselves, if we could stop these 5 million deaths, what we, do we need to do? Because this, we, this is why we're here. We're not here for water at water's sake. We're not here for sanitation for sanitation's sake. Let us in our systems thinking, ask ourselves, how do we save the lives of 5 million children? There used to be 11 million annually in the year 2000. So there has been great progress, great progress, more than 50% reduction. But we are still losing 5 million children every year in 2023. The first thing you'd like to ask is, you need to know what they're dying from. And this chart tells you that the majority of them are dying if you look at the blue section, because the blue section is really the preventable deaths. It is diarrheal diseases, 534,000. It is respiratory infection, pneumonia, being one of the biggest killers. I just came out of Madrid where we were having a meeting on how to end childhood pneumonia. Tetanus, meningitis, whooping cough, measles, malaria, leishmaniasis, all this is what is killing our children. So if this is what is killing our children then, how would we want to work on the five million so that we play our part? 
the next question will be to ask, what really is behind the reason behind the death? Because a child doesn't just die of pneumonia. A child doesn't just die of diarrhea. And the reasons, if you are just to take two, and this is why I'm saying this is not exhaustive. I'm just using it to demonstrate the system's approach to the challenges we face today. And if you look at those two, pneumonia and diarrhea, you will see for pneumonia, I've just picked a few. It is childhood wasting, air pollution, poor sanitation. That's what we'd have to work on to save the five million children. And for diarrhea, it is stunting, undernutrition, lack of access to water. Those two, as you can see, are the leading causes. And if you actually just look at, at the bottom, I've said poor health systems. That's a given. We have only in, in, in the continent of Africa, only maybe 46% of the population have access to health services. And even where the child services are available, there is financial difficulty, which is the whole construct around how to create universal health coverage. But if you look at those things, and what I've tried to do is just ask myself, what is the cause or pathway? What do you have to work with to change and reduce the death from pneumonia? And you can see, actually, it's all the system together. Because if you're talking about childhood wasting, that is related to stunting, undernutrition, lack of access to water is causing diarrhea, poor sanitation, pneumonia, and then you look at all these other things about poverty, you look at lack of access to clean water and sanitation, which are related to malnutrition, back and forth, gender inequality, and education. We know that a child who is born to a woman who has gone to secondary school has a five times higher chance of survival than one whose mother had not gone to secondary school. So you tell me, therefore, is educating women a health investment? Isn't it a health investment? So all these things are related. You talk about climate change, and we'll talk about that at the end. Fertility and spacing, I said, if children are dying, women will want to have more of them. So they are related. Urban planning and infrastructure. This is the great convergence that we are talking about if we want to address the biggest problems of our time. So what is health? When you look at this agenda, this again I borrowed from the Global Health Science and Practice, I love this chart because it basically reminds us of what I talked about at the beginning, that health is not about health care. Health is not about the health infrastructure. And I think I need to say here that for the WASH community, I have seen more advocacy around WASH in health facilities than I have seen about WASH generally. And that is missing the point, because washing health facilities is actually towards the downstream. Upstream is where the lives should be saved, because you're trying to maintain health. And if you look at this, 85 to 90% of people don't need to go to any health facility. They're born healthy, they live healthy. The problem is that we do not provide for them the services, the ecosystem that they need to stay healthy. Then we build the health system to make sure we return them to health. But our focus should be the top. And actually, if you look at financing of healthcare, I'll just give you quick numbers now, that in Netherlands, generally in Europe, the government spends about $4,000 per person per year on health services. That is hospital-based or whatever services, all of them, curative. $4,000 is what the government spends, not out of pocket. $4,000 is what the government spends. If you look at Africa, because of the low fiscal space, high population, small economy, $50 per person per, per, per year. Five zero. And in some countries, 17. Five zero is just my own average, and that is based on good tax collection, allocation to health. So you're trying to solve in Asia and Africa, where I say 83% of the children are dying, you're trying to solve a $4,000 problem with $50 would intend to be better actually investing in the first section where you don't have to spend money in the hospitals. So this is basically to say that health is the outcome of concurrently applied social, political, economic, and health systems for all. That's how you achieve health, by focusing on keeping people healthy. I just want to show you this chart to show that medical science, which has been the focus of UHC, of UHC, is actually only additive 
to public health. If you look at this chart, you look at the first chart, you see that the general use of vaccination only started in the 60s. But child mortality reduction started in the 1900 without vaccination. It had been going on because of improvements in public health. The two most important, water sanitation, hygiene, around that. So basically to remind us that reduction in mortality is not a medical, it's a medical science second, but it's a public health first. And safe water is responsible for 1.2 million deaths annually and 6% of deaths in low-income countries as a result of unsafe water. So I want us to come towards the end, but I, I don't do that with for now, bringing you to this concept of UHC. What is UHC? In 2019, we went to, to the UN General Assembly and we said, we want a declaration signed by our government to commit on universal health coverage. We got that. And in that document, first it defines universal health coverage as quality health services, and down there you see it includes health promotion to prevention, treatment, rehabilitation, and everything else there. And the government adopted that declaration. And within it, in Clause 15, it says that universal health coverage includes clean air, safe drinking water, sanitation, safe, sufficient, nutritious food, and secure shelter. Did we have the WASH community in the meeting? Probably, I hope we did. We are now going back to New York in September to negotiate, to renegotiate this declaration. Is there going to be WASH community? Hopefully. Next week we have a multi-stakeholder hearing in the UN organized by the President of the General Assembly to discuss the declaration before the, the government adopt it. Is there going to be WASH community? Hopefully. Um, this one, I'll skip that chat. And now we face a new systems risk, climate change. Of course, you know, we are now discussing climate change, and we know that other than mitigation, reduction of carbon emissions, greenhouse gases, there is a huge agenda that because we are most likely to miss the 1.5 degrees rise above pre-industrial time temperatures, most likely it's going to happen. We don't see great commitments by governments on the Paris Agreement. We have to start thinking about adaptation. How do we ensure people are protected from the impacts of global warming? And one of the largest vulnerability in those countries is water sanitation. It is actually water. It is zoonotic diseases that are related to interaction between humans and animals as they seek for water and vector-borne diseases. So water and sanitation related health vulnerabilities are going to be critical. We are going to the COP28 in November. We've been negotiating because the Conference of Parties on Climate Change has focused largely on mitigation, greenhouse gas reduction. We have pushed forward to end up with health being at the center, not as a side event, but being in the middle of the conversation on climate change because we must think of adaptation ahead because mitigation is important and we must push, but we are going to end up with vulnerabilities before we can achieve our mitigation goals. We have managed to get a health day at COP28 in Dubai in November. And I want to ask, is the voice of WASH on the table? Because water and sanitation will be the most disrupted by global warming, increasing in losing our gains on health. In conclusion, health is not a sum of health workers, health facilities, and health technologies. But it's a sum of all human development investments. Secondly, that investments in water and sanitation are health investments. And finally, health is cheaper than healthcare, with equity at the center. Last first, last mile becoming the first mile. I just want to know whether you are ready. Thank you very much.